Thanks for coming, everybody. All right, let's see if some of this stuff works. Check all my systems here. All right. <clears throat> Are there any diabetics here? One, two, three, three? Did I get the count right? Are you type one or type two? Two, two, one. Okay. So there's diabetes type 2, which is largely a, a diet and exercise and somehow a genetic problem. But diabetes type 1, which I have, I've had for 25 years, I produce zero insulin. So I, I have a non-working pancreas. Uh, I can't walk it off, as they say. Um, there's not much I can do. I can improve my diet, but I really can't do much more. And the interesting thing about diabetes, uh, as I'm sure the other type 1 in the room will appreciate, is that if you look at me, you see a reasonably straight-backed, somewhat competent-looking individual, right? You say, say hey, he's pretty much an able-bodied person, right? But I've got uh, uh, an insulin pump with tubes that apparently have knots in them. We'll talk about whether that's a problem or not later. Uh, that's plugged into me 24-7. Right there, I have a sensor array that's Bluetooth and a battery and a needle that's plugged in right there. I've got other ports over here. I have a Bluetooth continuous glucose meter that talks to that. And I have this bridge that I'm gonna talk about today. But all of that gets hidden under my clothes. So you don't know what a shit day that I've had today. With, uh, with diabetes, that's kind of the thing, right? Everyone's got something, right? Not every disability is an obvious one. Uh, if I didn't mention it, you'd probably never know. So being a diabetic kind of sucks. Um, there's a lot of diabetic memes that are like private jokes, like this one, like how long are you going away for? Well, just a day. That's all the crap that I have. I actually have had nasty notes from the people in the hotel wondering why I'm putting away medical waste in their, um, and do I have syringes? Am I a heroin user? Because they see all of the equipment that gets thrown away in my hotel room. But then do I take it and ship it back? How do I, how do I dispose of those things? It's a challenge. Now, uh, to the type twos that were up there as well who raised their hands, um, type one is not type two. And I think that the type twos would probably agree that it's unfortunate that diabetes type one and diabetes type two are called diabetes. They're really entirely different uh, systems. So the kind that I have, type 1 diabetes, is a fairly complicated uh, thing. It is not like your grandma's type 2. I'm not going to be talking about type 2. So while some of this might be of interest to the type 2s, it is fundamentally a, uh, a little bit more complicated problem. Now, I've been writing about diabetes for 15 years on my blog. Um, back in 2007, so that's nine years now, I tweeted every single moment of a day that I thought about diabetes. That means every time I checked my blood sugar, every time I pricked my finger, every time I ate a cookie, every time. I ended up tweeting, I ended up tweeting about 174 times that day. So it is a background constant process where I am always thinking about it. And it is a psychic weight that presses down on me. I probably spend at least an hour of my day, a minute here, two minutes there, three minutes there, trying to stay vertical trying to stay alive. It sucks. I've done videos on this. And the analogy that I like to use, and the analogy that has worked so far, is what is called the airplane analogy. So I'll try to explain this to you now. And I would also point out the differences here between type 1 and type 2. I produce no insulin. So we'll talk about what insulin does and uh, why it's important. So here's the analogy. And I apologize. I'm going to be using a North American uh, analogy here. So let's say that you are flying from L.A. to New York, okay? You would like your flight to look something like this, right? Nice and smooth flight. Um, this is what my day would hopefully look like. If you don't have diabetes, you have a very smooth day. But uh, because I want to check my altitude, that is checking my blood sugar, I have to get my blood sugar meter out, right? And then I prick my finger and I look at it. That's like checking the altitude on the plane. 
okay? Food will raise the altitude of the plane, and I could die slowly in space. Uh, or I could take insulin, which lowers the altitude of this plane, and then I could die quickly if I crash into the ground. This is why this analogy works great, because high blood sugar kills you slow in, in space, and uh, low blood sugar kills you quite quickly. Now, I can check my altitude maybe, you know, three or four times in a day. Maybe if you're really hardcore, you might go and check your, your altitude more than that, right? But for the most part, you're limited to your patients and the number of times that you can go and check your, you know, your, your, your finger, yeah? Then, if I want to make changes, I can either eat, which raises my altitude, or I can take insulin, which lowers it, except eating depends on the food, raises it in different levels. So I might eat something and nothing might happen for a half an hour. Insulin is very slow. It's being injected into the subcutaneous fat, into the interstitial fat between your skin and your, and your muscles. It's not being into the vein. So it takes about a half an hour to an hour before anything happens. So imagine if you're flying an airplane and you say, oh my God, we have to make, take action quickly, and you push forward on the stick and you wait for 45 minutes. Okay, and you look at the altimeter, the altitude, and you say, oh my God, look at that, we're about to crash. Well, you're actually looking at the past. When I test my blood sugar, I'm seeing my blood sugar 15, 20 minutes ago. So it's kind of like piloting the Mars rover, right? You make a motion, you wait for an hour, and then you wait another hour to get back the information. So now, imagine what your flight across the U.S. is going to look like if you have to deal with this kind of a thing. But you never know that those ups and downs are happening because when you see a point on the line, you don't actually know the slope through that point. You have no idea. You, if I check my blood sugar right now and it's 200, I go, cool. But it means nothing without the second point, right? So without a slope, it's pretty much useless, which then means I have to double up all of my blood sugar and I have to spread them out. So it becomes quite inconvenient. And if you have any questions or you think any of this is crap, please speak up because it'll be a make for a better conversation. I've written about this and ha hacking diabetes. I've had people on my, um, my podcast and talked about it. So as we just covered, food raises blood sugar meaning that it is everything you eat turns into sugar, it sits in your blood, and then it needs to be delivered. What I fail to do is I fail to have any insulin, which then opens up the cells and allows the food to be delivered. So it's as if it's piling up at the doorstep of the cells. Now, do you in Denmark have those little, um, those little honey uh, bears that you use to squeeze honey onto like a sandwich? You know what I'm talking about? They're like a little plastic bear. You know, you know the, the sugary crap at the top of the, sugar, of, the, of the honey container? You know how honey turns into like weird stuff? That's kind of what happens in your body. And that's why your eyes, diabetics go blind, why they lose their feet, is that that sugar is just in the system and it starts to kind of crust up if it's not moving. And it clogs things up. Again, with all things, this is an oversimplification, but it gives you an idea of, oh, that's why their eyes are, oh, why diabetics go blind, because the little tiny capillaries get clogged, and that's why they can't feel their fingers, because things are getting clogged in that process, as we are marinating in our own sugar. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, injected insulin lowers blood sugar, okay? So too much insulin, though, removes all of that blood sugar, and I have no fuel, and then you die, you have a coma, you have a seizure, okay? So it's a balance. It's a very, very rough balance. So highs will kill you slow. Marinating in your own sugar will cause you to lose your vision, lose your limbs. Uh, it really sucks. It's about the worst, most miserable way to go. You literally lose a toe at a time until they finally cut your feet off um, because the body just tries to keep the sugar here and forgets about the, the feet. You, lose, you get numbness and all kinds of bad stuff happens. Leading cause of blindness. Lows will kill you quick where you have low blood sugar and you just fall over, have a seizure, uh, have a coma, fall asleep and don't wake up. Kind of sucks. Okay. Don't worry, I'll, I'll lift you up at the end, but I got to tear you down. <laughs> I have to tear you down first, so bear with me. You should be thinking, gosh, that really sucks, and I don't want that. That's what you should be thinking right now. Where's my type 1 guy at? Right? Type 2s, you feel bad right now? Good. Well, you're like, eh, not so bad. 
you had lunch, so you're probably feeling pretty good. Okay, here's how the rest of you all who aren't diabetics uh, do stuff. Uh, you eat whatever the hell you like. Uh, you go to sleep with totally awesome blood sugar. You wake up with great blood sugar and don't appreciate it. And then you eat whatever the hell you like. So that's pretty much what you're doing right now, and we hate you for it. And your blood sugar, if I tested your blood sugar, it would probably look like that. You do have highs, but your highs last five, 10 minutes, okay? Because you have a really great system called the pancreas that releases insulin in an immediate, to immediate effect into the body, while I have to shove it in through a tube externally in a very inefficient way. So here's what we have to do, okay? I have to listen to my body, adjust food, exercise, and insulin. Something as simple as me arriving here in a different time zone and taking the train from the airport to the hotel that also involved walking a kilometer and a half, carrying my bags, remembering that it was three in the morning in my head and I hadn't eaten yet, was a math problem. It was non-trivial for me to get my ass to this conference, okay? I have to listen to all these different things. And what I try to do is rather than pricking my finger, I listen to this, this CGM. This thing here is taped to my body and it has a little uh, battery. And it is listening to the interstitial fluid. That's not the blood, but that's the schmutz, the schmutz that's in your fat, right? It's just the liquid, because we're all made of liquid, right? And it's sending electrical impulses in there, and it's coming up with a, a resistance number that we then interpolate into a blood sugar number. But it's never touching blood, so it's a guess. I kind of know what it is, my blood sugar is. But it's good information. And then I can get a more accurate number by looking at my uh, blood sugar, right? Then I have to do a bunch of math. Okay, I'll show you some charts today where I woke up, my blood sugar was amazing. Super awesome blood sugar. I had three mini blueberry muffins. The little tiny ones. Like they're nothing. They're like that big. I had three of them. I went online, used my data plan to find out that they have 10 grams of carbohydrates each. I took an appropriate amount of insulin. And then an hour later, I was feeling like crap. I'll show you the chart. Blood sugar was off the chart. I don't know if Danish people love sugar or if it was all a lie, or if they just dipped it in sugar and it was an assassination attempt, you know, we'll never know. Those three blueberry muffins, not big ones to be clear, little tiny blueberry muffins, completely have effed up my day. Uh, and I'm sure you all had like an extra cookie, so yeah. And this is what my blood sugar looks like. And then I won't know if I'm doing okay until 20 years from now when I either have feet or I don't. And then I'll tell you that I did a good job. That's the thing that's so insidious. We work every single day, hour by hour, to try to not die, but we won't actually find out until later when we see if we did a good job or not. It's like diet and exercise, right? It's exactly like diet and exercise. You'll know in 10, 20 years when you don't have a stroke that you did the right thing. So it's really insidious kind of a thing. All right, now, every diabetic engineer, any diabetic, the moment they become diabetic, we have three different people here that are all diabetics, I will bet you that immediately they researched it and then tried to solve it with software. They got an Excel sheet or they built something, like every diabetic engineer every time always goes and builds something. So I became diabetic and I immediately said, all right, fine, I've never heard of this disease. Then I studied it. I decided I knew everything there was to know about this disease about two days later. And and then I wrote a Palm Pilot system to manage that. And it worked out very well, actually. I wrote it for myself, and I actually updated it with color, which was awesome. And uh, it bought, you know, paid for my first house, so that, you know, that I had that going for me. Every diabetic engineer tries to solve this problem with technology. Now, this was an article that I wrote in 2001. So this is 15 years ago, okay? And 15 years ago, I said, and I, didn't, I couldn't even believe it that I said this 15 years ago. Bluetooth was just coming out. And I was like, oh, Bluetooth devices surround me. My pump could talk to my cell phone and send the data. The, remember, the word cloud didn't even exist yet, right? The people who say cloud weren't even born yet, you know, the, the young people. Um, and I said, I could get a minute-by-minute -minute history to my doctor. I mean, I was thinking about this 15 years ago. We didn't have the technology, okay? I tried to do this. Remember this? I plugged this cell phone thing into the Palm 5 and I would update the data. So I was trying to do a CGM, continuous glucose meter, in the cloud. But I didn't have the implant and I had to prick my fingers all the time. And it sucked. 
But this is what every diabetic engineer ever has done. They have an Excel sheet or some software and they try to understand their disease. It's very frustrating. My wife and I traveled the country managing and logging my blood sugar at every step all these years ago. And I went and wrote a bunch of software, glucose meter downloader. I wrote this in 2007. Why did I have to write a glucose meter downloader? This is where you plug the meter into your machine and you download your data. I had to write it because the specs are not open. Think about that. Yeah, people are like, mm -hmm. He actually, actually had a reaction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is unacceptable. Right? Yes, it is unacceptable, okay? So you'd think in 2016 they would be, they'd be like open specs. Nope, nope. They, uh, I had to go and single-handedly, and then other, after the fact, a number of other people got involved, and now we've gone and we've cracked every single blood sugar meter. But they, they're trying to sell strips, test strips, for me to check my blood. Why is their data in any way a proprietary secret thing? I have no idea. That's the number one thing right there that you're going to hear throughout this talk that is causing us problem, is that we have a medical device, I have, I have my data in my body, I own my data, I want my data, but the specs are not published and they will not allow me to get access to that data. So even now, you can't go and download a PDF or an SDK for your blood sugar meter downloader. They want you to get their software and do it that way, which is stupid. I think we all agree, and your initial reaction makes me happy because yeah, that's totally lame. So I wrote an article in 2012 called The Sad State of Diabetes Technology, which was an extended technology rant where I said that this is complete crap, you're holding us back, this sucks. And an individual came in here and said that his 12-year-old was diagnosed nine months ago and basically said, someone should do this, you know, this is what I do. After he read my blog post, this gentleman here quit his job and started a nonprofit and started building a continuous glucose meter. And continually goes back and points to that comment in that day as the moment when it kind of all turned around. So that's kind of when it started. Because it's about DIY, right? That is an insulin pump. Think about that for a second. That's this. Now this is the top of the line. Looks like you could play snake on it, doesn't it? <laughs> huh? The thing's built like a tank, but that is a crappy little Nokia looking thing right there. And that is the top of the line you know, system, but at least it's not a giant backpack, okay? This is a do-it-yourself homemade insulin pump that someone made in the early 70s out of wood. Uh, it was an Italian gentleman, and he carved it, and basically he took a plastic syringe here and a screw drive that then pulls the plunger down. That is fundamentally how this works today. That is how my insulin pump works. You can actually see inside there's a screw that turns, which causes lateral motion that pushes against the syringe. That's all it is. Isn't that funny? Now, people have tried to get continuous glucose information for a long period of time. This was a thing called the gluco watch that would have these metal plates that would touch your skin and it would send electrical signals into your skin, and it would look at the interstitial fluid and the sweat on your skin. And it was super awesome. It would tell your blood sugar every five minutes, but it also caused severe burns. <laughs> so after those scars healed, I covered them with an Apple Watch. They are out of business because that was a stupid, stupid idea. All right, so think about this again. Let's go back to the loop. What is the loop? Figure out what my blood sugar is make some calculations based on all the context. Am I exercising? What am I eating? Are they fast carbs? Are they slow carbs, carbohydrates? Then the right, deliver the insulin. There's two words that we use uh, in this context. There is the bolus. This is a general medical term for a bolus or a large infusion of some liquid. So I want two units of insulin right now, a bolus of insulin. And then there's the basal, which is the background a little bit all the time. I get a half a unit an hour, always in the background, just kind of quietly doing its thing. So you've got your, your basil, and then it's like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Diabetics that do not have a pump, where's my type one? Are you a pump? So he's a pump. So if he didn't have a pump, he would do what they call the poor man's pump, which is MDI, multiple daily injections. He'd take one injection in the morning, which would be his background, and then he would take a, a, an injection every meal, usually with a pen. Pens are super popular in Europe. So he would have a pen like this, 
and he would go and jab that into his gut, uh, you know, a couple, three, four times a day. That's why you have kind of a lousy flight, because you're going like this. Pumps are great because I can make tiny little updates. You can't do a half a unit or two tenths of a unit with a pump, but with a with a pen. But with a pump, I can. That's two units. So I can even do it in my pocket quietly, right? Seriously, that matters. People are really embarrassed about this. There's, a, there's an emotional connection to having that. That's 24 hours a day. When I sleep, you know, during, during spooning time, the, 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 it's not sexy, let me tell you. Uh, the number one reason that people don't get pumps is that they, they, the emotional attachment of like, I've got this thing that is now attached to me all the time and it sucks. And once you get over that though, it's better, okay? It is demonstrably better. So, to close the loop, I need read and write. Okay, but what's blocking us? Well, to read from these devices, I need specs. Those specs don't exist. They are closed systems. So if I want to talk to this device right here, I need to figure out how to speak to it. This speaks Bluetooth. This is my Dexcom. It's showing my blood sugar is going up right now from, um, from lunch. Okay, that talks Bluetooth to that battery. There is an ISO Bluetooth standard that was proposed for pumps and CGMs, but they're not using it. They're doing their own thing. No open standards, no published specs. Now, on the right, meaning how do I take action, I need a, a pump that supports remote access. There really are none. This is a 10-year-old pump with an outdated firmware. It is the very, very last version of the firmware that allowed remote access before a hacker went and proved at a Black Hat conference that you could remotely administer insulin and you know, potentially hurt someone. So then they closed that loop and now you can't do remote access. Now you'd need to be you know, within a couple of feet of me and know the serial number of the pump, but still, okay? So there's security and liability concerns. Additionally, this pump was created before uh, Bluetooth using an obscure 915 megahertz RF radio frequency command. So that's kind of inconvenient as well. Also, you need uh, storage. Where you're going to put this stuff, health kit is great. Let's you store it and share it with applications on your phone. Uh, remote access was the first step for, uh, for diabetics, particularly the parents of diabetics. There's a joke that there are type 1s, type 2s, and parents. Because if you had a 9-year-old or a 7-year-old who had diabetes, and then you got a continuous meter that let you see their blood sugar, that would be amazing, right? But then you send them to school. And how do you see their blood sugar? How do you warn them before they're gonna crash? You know, there's no way. So you, we needed remote viewing of this, correct? There's a USB port here. So once a day, you can go and plug it into your computer and download your blood sugar data. That would be cool, right? So what they came up with is a system by which they would lie to it and say, I'm a PC, when they were really a Raspberry Pi. And they would then plug the meter into the Raspberry Pi, which would then, every five minutes, say, hey, it's me, the PC, download your data. Hey, it's me, the PC, download your data, every five minutes, 24 hours a day. Then you put a wireless adapter on the Raspberry Pi, and then you get a phone, like an Android phone with a tethering plan, but then you're going to need a big battery, and then you take that stuff and you put it in your seven-year-old's backpack and you make them carry it around. And that's amazing. I know it sounds funny, but that was a life changer. Then you can give the school nurse access to your kid's blood sugar. You can then put it on a pebble watch and look at your time and your child's blood sugar and see it live in a browser. So that is my live blood sugar right now. Please don't share the URL. Keep that private. That is my blood sugar this moment. I had a low right there. It's actually four or five in the morning right now, remember? See that dot there that says two units? That was me taking two units of insulin for lunch. You see that I'm headed in an upwardly direction, but I'm trying to stay in between these lanes here, okay? These are the muffins. You see that excursion there? That was the muffin incident. And I can actually go back in time and explore the muffins. 
right here, okay? This is remote viewing of this data, and I'm using my data plan here while I'm in Europe. So we're talking Bluetooth to this. It then goes to my phone. It then gets uploaded to another system that is run by this company that is proprietary and closed. And then I have a web job written in Node.js that runs on Azure that then sucks the data out of the proprietary and closed system and drops it into a MongoDB database, where I then choose to look at it how I want to look at it. Does that make sense? Yes. It's funny how closed things suck and open things are good. So if one were to close the loop then and go beyond Night Scout, which was that, that, that remote viewing system, they could go and build an open source artificial pancreas like this. They would have the meter, right? That's the Dexcom that I showed you. Talking to the Raspberry Pi, then a pump, a big battery, and then this thing, number four, this CareLink USB. This is an obscure device that people could buy along with the pump that it turns out is a RF USB thing that lets you control the pump. So then you could plug that into the Raspberry Pi, talk to it over a COM port. This gets large and you, know, you end up wearing a fanny pack. And then this could control the pump. Okay? But it turns out if you open that up right, and poke around inside, it's actually just pretty basic stuff. And it turns out that they discovered that a, a TI CL1111 uh, $75 USB uh, 900 megahertz thing transmitter deal is just as well, and I don't have to go and buy the one from the medical company. Then they decoded that process, so then I can plug that into here, and then it turns into this whole kind of ridiculous dongle hell, okay? And you end up with a bunch of crap sticking out of this. And it ends up looking like that, which is sad. So then people started exploring, because what are the root uh, issues here? Bluetooth radio frequency, uh, and internet access. So we start looking at different things like photons, wixels, other little tiny small devices. Uh, this individual here wanted to take the data from his Dexcom, which is this continuous meter, and put it on his Android. So he, he wrote a bridge. So that little device right there is a Bluetooth bridge into that device. So then we discovered that the Intel Edison is a lovely thing. The Intel Edison looks like this. Okay, tiny little thing, right? And we found that you could go to SparkFun and you could stack a bunch of these boards. Like, you know how Arduinos stack up? You could get a board with a battery and with USB, lots of them, and then stack the, Ar the um, not the Arduino, but the Edison on top there, and that'd be cool, but it's a stack, and that kind of sucks. So we went and we talked to a gentleman named Morgan who knows about electronics, and he took the reference design for the Edison and built this custom board. The Edison runs Linux. That is a fully featured Linux running machine. And I can then plug in a battery to it, like this. There you go. And that is running Linux, has Bluetooth, has Wi-Fi, and he added 900 and 15 megahertz RF. So now we can control the pump. Then that, those little devices can be made quite small and put into boxes. That is a project that's called Open APS, the Open Artificial Pancreas System. And it's written in Python and it runs as a series of scripts that talks back and forth between all these different devices and tries to close the loop. That is one open source artificial pancreas system, but there's actually two. Here's another one that I'm currently running as we sit here. Let me try to share my screen. 
All right, so this is my phone here. Okay. And remember, we saw my blood sugar before. See, it says 148 up there. So here's lunch, and I'm currently right there. And the dotted line is the prediction about how it's going to handle lunch and get me back here. Make sense? See the green dot in the upper corner there, the, the green loop, indicating that two minutes ago it ran a loop, and it looked at my blood sugar at 212, and it looked at my insulin container at 211, and it added some insulin. See, 1.65 units an hour. It's making tiny adjustments. This is important. This is not a self-driving car just as the Tesla is not a self-driving driving car. The Tesla is a really cool, stay-in-the-lane, fancy cruise control thing. The Tesla does not stop for stoplights. It goes right through them. doesn't stop for humans. doesn't even stop for bicycles. But if you're on a highway or a freeway in the center lane with clear lines, it will try as much as it can to stay in that lane. 20-degree turn, no problem. Tesla can handle that. 90-degree turn, it's going to say grab the wheel. This is the Tesla of systems. I put in the food at the bottom there. You see the green where it says 27 grams? I put in that I ate some food right there at the bottom in green. Notice that that is then decaying. That means going down to zero. That's digesting. So that's, that's lunch digesting. Then the insulin there where it says 2.51 has a half-life and then gets used up and then the blood sugar reacts accordingly, okay? This is making tiny little, it says insulin delivery, tiny little changes, but not major enough that I can crash. The idea being not that it's supposed to be perfectly smooth, but that it's supposed to mostly stay in the blue, and when it is in the blue, it stays in the blue. It's okay that I'm outside the blue right now because I just ate, plus it's also four in the morning, and my body is acting like, what are you doing eating at four in the morning? And this is all very appropriate. Additionally, uh, stretched y-axes tend to lie. So that looks like a big deal, doesn't it? Doesn't that look kind of scary? Like, oh shit, look at that, something bad happened. But if we explore that in a different app with a slightly different y-axis, it's like, oh, that's not quite so dramatic, is it? Let's see if we can do it sideways. Right? See this here? Also not so dramatic. So you have to really think about uh, axes. That left side there that went all to hell, that's the muffins. I don't know. I think they were just steeped in sugar or something. But look at this, though. This is great. This is last night. That's me in a foreign country, in a different time zone, sleeping like a baby with my blood sugar effectively perfect for hours and hours and hours. This is what happens to us, is we'll eat something, when we forget to take some insulin or we'll take the wrong amount, we'll fall asleep. We'll wake up eight hours later, having completely forgotten that we've been marinating in our sugar for an entire half a night. It's really, really challenging and very, very frustrating. Now, here we go, look what just happened. Look, you see what happened, y'all? Look, it just went 143, 147, now it's flattened it out. Notice that the whole, prediction just, the whole prediction model just changed, just as we're standing here. What did the pump decide to do? Look in the orange at the top there where it says 212. What did it do? It shut off. It immediately shut off at zero units. That's the only way it can stop me, right? So what it can do is it makes a little change, and then it coasts. It lets, it, it lets back a little bit because it has no ability to pull up Right? If, we're, if we're pushing on the airplane, right? we're going down, 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 down. The body's natural reaction is to float back up again. So the way that it pulls back up is it just kind of lets go and tries to let the air current find its way. There is talk of doing what they call dual hormone pumps. So I would literally have insulin in one pump and sugar in another pump. And then this pump would consciously overdose me get me as close to zero as possible, and then start pumping sugar to pull up, pull up at the last minute. It's called dual or bi-hormonal. It's a little bit scary, but it's an idea. 
that is being worked on. Right there you see I will eventually reach uh, I will re eventually reach 100 milligrams. Right there, okay? Now, this system is written in Swift, and the brain is here. So there's two different systems here. There's the open APS, the open artificial pancreas system, which can run on a Raspberry Pi or on a Edison. So it can be very small. It doesn't, this is a, like a prototype, like you hack on the Pi and then you deploy to the Edison, okay? And that would be entirely self-contained. I would put that in my pocket in a 3D printed case and that would be it. And the brain is there. Or I had this handy pocket supercomputer that I've been, you know, looking at cat pictures with. Uh, why not have this do some work? Okay. But remember what we said about the pump. The pump is 900 megahertz. Well, the sensor that I have here is Bluetooth. So the read is Bluetooth, we can get the read, but the pump is 900 megahertz. So what we did is a fellow named Pete built this, which is a Bluetooth to 915 megahertz RF bridge. He made the 15-year-old pump look like a Bluetooth device, and then he talks to it over serial port with Python. How insane is that? So watch this. This is this device here. I'm going to say fetch recent history. See the lights that just turned on? So it's showing the, both the in and the out. So right now, this here, this Swift app, is calling into this over Bluetooth, talking to the pump with its proprietary internal format, which it's then going to formulate as a JSON object. They've effectively made a 15-year-old medical device a web API. Because why not? That would make it super easy to parse, right? So that's still talking, right? That's going to take a while. It's kind of like a BBS, right? It's like 2400 baud or something. It's some slow, slow baud rate. But it's using this pump as a back-end database because this is the authoritative source. It's not going to keep track of its, in its own system about how much insulin this thing delivered. That would be dangerous. This thing knows how much insulin it delivered. Does that make sense? So we trust that as the authoritative source, just as we trust this blood sugar system as the authoritative source. That is a safety mechanism, right? So this thing is still talking. It's almost done. This does this every five minutes. And this is the funny thing. None of these systems were ever designed to have that kind of a download happen more than once a day. But we're doing it every five minutes, 244 times a day. So look, all that information. So, for example, here we go, a normal bolus of 2.5 units. We programmed 2.5, and we had an amount of 2.5. Here's a temporary basal of zero for 30 minutes, meaning turn the pump off for 30 minutes and see if he'll come back up again. Does that make sense? I can go and talk to the pump. I can send button presses and do all kinds of stuff, and you can see it actually tuned to a very specific... Um, Frequency. That device is in my pocket all the time. Yep, see, it's still making adjustments. Look at the difference between how, sorry, look at the difference between how the muffin situation resolved itself. It, I, it, it oscillated for a minute, didn't it? Versus how it's clear that lunch is going to work itself out just fine. I had a very short excursion, and I'll be right back in the blue. But what if I wanted to go exercise? I could get in trouble. I'm in a foreign country. Who knows? Maybe they don't speak English. I could go and say, use workout glucose targets if I go for a walkabout and go walk into downtown. So for two hours, so look, it puts me higher. It runs me hot. It runs me higher. But remember, highs will kill you slow. Lows will kill you quick. A low in a foreign country is a problem, and I don't know how to say my blood sugar is too low in Danish. I do know how to say it in German, though, which is super useful, actually, because I had a low blood sugar in, in Germany, and it was the only thing I could remember. I was like a homeless person. I was like on the ground, like, meine Blutzucker ist so niedrig, you know. Ah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if that would work here. 
So I can go and set things like workout values as well. The gentleman who made this name, Nate, has even set it up on the Apple Watch. And what he's got here You can see my current blood sugar is 140, and where I will end up is 76. I can long press and enter in carbs if I'm going to eat. And I can say, well, what am I going to eat? Am I going to have candy, tacos, or pizza? <laughs> because America, right? <laughs> now, um, seriously, though, what do you think the candy, tacos, and pizza means? My type 2 people, what do you think that means? What? My watch is black. That was very helpful, Christian. Thank you so much. What do you, what do you, think, that, what do you think those three values represent? Exactly. She nailed it. Sugar, uh, candy, something that absorbs quickly. Pizza, something that absorbs quite slowly. It literally relates to the absorption rate. So if we go back here and we go down to the active carbohydrates, see right there, that 18 grams? See the different absorption rates? I'll go and I'll say, I'm going to have some M&Ms. That's going to hit me quickly and be gone within an hour or two. Or I'm going to have some steak and that's going to take 240 minutes to exit the system. So you have the carbohydrate absorption rate. And you see where it says COB, carbohydrates on board. On board me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that lets me know how much insulin is on board, the IOB versus the carbohydrates on board. So I can look right here, and I look at this many times a day. I can see I have two units, 2.47 units left, meaning that are being absorbed because everything takes time. I've got 16 grams of carbs that has yet to absorb into my system. And the goal is to stay in that blue line as long as you can. I'm going to click through here a little bit. That guy is crazy. He has a bunch of stuff plugged in. That's Chris Dancy. He is the world's most quantified man. Uh, he has all these sensors working at all times to tell you everything about the world around him. Pretty cool stuff. Once you have these open APIs, you can do cool stuff like apply if this, then that to your blood sugar. But isn't it funny that again, we, the amount of work that we had to put in to get this data. Like you might think, oh yeah, I mean, I add glucose readings to Google Calendar, awesome idea. Well, you gotta get them first. You have to get that data. You have to get that data that is trapped in these systems uh, out. So open APS, uh, is uh, an open source project on GitHub. You can learn about the reference design and build your own. This is really, really important. None of this is therapy. None of this is appropriate. None of this is allowed. None of this is from a doctor. Okay? This is body hacking at its finest. Uh, you should not plug a child into this. You should, you know, if you do, that's on you. There are people who have done that, but that is on them. Okay? This is body hacking. And it is possible that you could hurt yourself. But a lot of work gets put into designing it for safety. Uh, Dana Lewis and her husband Scott, who worked on this system, uh, made sure that there are limits. Anything unexpected shuts the thing off and says, go back to normal. So it is just like a Tesla in the sense of, if anything unexpected happens, you better have your hands on the wheel. That's a really great uh, analogy. So OpenAPS is the one that runs on the Edison or the... Raspberry Pi, it's open source, is written in Python. It talks to Night Scout, which is this system, which is simply remote viewing. I've plugged Loop, which is the second system. This is the one that runs on the iPhone. I've plugged that into Night Scout as well. So I'm seeing it looped a minute ago. I see the voltage of the pump, the battery. I see uh, insulin on board, 1.5 units. You see, I just went down a little bit right there. I see a predictive line of my blood sugar. Loop is, uh, requires you to get Xcode, compile it yourself, have an Apple developer ID. If you want to build yourself one of these devices, you have to work. It's going to take you 
you know, a week of thought and another week of tuning. But it's super fun if you have anyone who's a diabetic who would be interested in this kind of stuff. <laughs> the point I want to make to folks is to, if, you're, if you work in healthcare or you have any other uh, health type in, in situations, that your data is your right. You should have access to your own freaking data. It is amazing how much work we have to do just to get our own blood sugar data, our own health data. Um, so I hope that we understand that we can't really regulate innovation. And one of the great things about this project is their hashtag, we are not waiting. I've been diabetic for 25 years, and every year they tell me, five more years and we'll cure you. They've told me that 25 years. So what I think is great about this is that the teams that work on, on Loop, on Open APS, got tired of waiting. They built their own open hardware that runs on the Edison or the Bluetooth bridge that we see right here, and they did it themselves, and they did it with open source. This is all pretty cool stuff. Let's do some, uh, some Q&A. Uh, Great, let's left. give the guy a hand. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> we have time for one or two uh, big questions, and while we are running over there, don't forget to uh, vote, please, on your app. Oh, and thanks for letting me use your, your phone. I needed to use his phone in order to tether to share the screen of my, uh, of my uh, iPhone, which worked really well, I think. Okay. Questions? Yeah. yeah here. Where are we at? Hey, what's up? Uh, good. I just wanted, have you ever, never thought about, like, uh, producing your own pump? I mean, you could crowdsource it or ask yeah. some, There are like, two or three guns. different open source pump systems as well, so you could build your own pump. Right now, though, it's about reliability. This thing is a tank. I mean, I have had this thing for 15 years, and I've probably had one issue with it, and it was a static electricity thing. So it's more about reliability than anything. This is a solved problem. So in the amount of work that would be required to make our own pump, I would much rather spend that time lobbying the company that made this for a secure, reliable way to talk to it and communicate with it. The, the fact that we have to hack things in order to talk to them is unacceptable. And uh, if it's not this manufacturer, it will be someone else that will give us access. Question up there. Uh, yeah, it was about the access to the data. Um, I did work for one of the pharmaceutical companies here in Denmark a few years back, and I remember actually they had a product which they wanted to launch, which was using Pocket PC, <laughs> but uh, it never got in the market because of like the FDA. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's one thing which, which you talk about giving access to the data, but isn't it more that the legislation has to um, be changed first? Yes, yeah. The so FDA that the pharmaceutical the companies can get their devices improved, approved. Yeah. yeah. So the FDA uh, is getting better because of the lobbying that is being done by the folks who run Open APS. They've gone to the White House, they've talked to people, and they've said that this is a right you know, to hack on these kind of things. But they've also done something interesting, what I think is significant is that even though there are no doctors involved, they're running it like it's a clinical kind of a thing, and they keep anonymized data, and they keep track of how many loop hours are done. They have hundreds of thousands of loop hours. That means, you know, just like, you know, you hear Elon uh, Musk always talking about how many millions of miles have been driven on autopilot. And that's a way of saying it's, it's safe or it's getting safe. There's hundreds of thousands of hours looped on pumps and people are okay more than any other system, including those in clinical trials. So you could take all of the hours being spent on clinical trials that are very slow moving that take years and years, and then you could look at these garage hackers in aggregate, they've looped more than, than the, uh, the others. And the FDA has noticed that. And day before yesterday, Medtronic released their first quasi-closed loop system uh, two days ago. So it's, I think that the open source hacker community is getting the attention of the FDA, but they're still very, very conservative and they don't want to kill anybody accidentally. Which is ironic because diabetics die of diabetes. So. I would much rather die in a diabetes open source hacking thing, you know, than, than like lose my feet. All right, one last question. Yeah. 
Um, seeing that the hack at uh, at Black Hat made the provider of the pump take it off and, and basically not make it tra transpond anymore, or give information out. Yeah. Do you think there's an ethical problem with that as well? That if we if we show security holes, we should also help those companies not to just shut down, but keep the beneficials of it. Yeah, of course. But if uh, hackers, white hat, black hat, regardless, all have a responsibility for ethical disclosure. That has, has been and continues to be how good hacking is done. Give them a heads up. You know, the Tesla just had a nasty, nasty uh, security bug. They gave Tesla a heads up. Tesla patched it. So then when the disclosure comes out, the firmware is already being pushed out. That's how you do it. You call the company first. You don't just demonstrate it live with millions of people out there on pumps. So yeah, uh, I agree that securing medical data and securing medical equipment is super important. It just needs to be done in, a, in an ethical way. That's it, folks. Thanks a lot again, Scott. Appreciate it.